Wayne Swan is former Deputy Prime Minister uh, of Australia and joins us live from uh, Brisbane. Wayne, thank you for joining us this morning. It's good to see you. It's uh, been a while, but you, uh, sh I'm sure, paid more attention, as much attention as anybody did uh, to the uh, decision by Treasurer Morrison denying uh, the access to the uh, consortium for Osgrib. Your thoughts? Was it xenophobia or did it make sense? No, it was none of those things at all. I think it was the correct decision, and I don't believe the Chinese authorities would be too surprised by this decision. We've had a surge of Chinese investment into our country, particularly over the last, uh, last decade. Uh, during my six years in the job, uh, Chinese investment in Australia went up uh, very fast, uh, and it continues to do so. And now it's broadening out across the Australian economy. It's no longer just investment uh, in commodities and miners. It's now far more broadly based across services and networks and so on. But we've always operated, and I outlined in 2008, a series right. of guidelines uh, by which we judge whether a foreign investment is in the national interest, and national security grounds are one of those guidelines. So, uh, so Wayne, you're, what, what you're saying was it was, an, it was, it was basically the China and its aggregate investment that maybe tipped the balance a little bit. Because, I mean, the Chinese investment in Australia has been diversified, hasn't it? Many different industries, many different uh, facets. I mean, it there's has no very one concentration, so. no monopolistic power in any one. And the guidelines don't allow that. But just because one project is ruled out on national security grounds doesn't mean to say there is a problem in the investment relationship. I personally dealt with the Chinese authorities on some issues dealing with national security and I found them very understanding about us applying national security grounds just as they would apply national security grounds when they made the judgment that those issues were at stake. So there's nothing new uh, in the Australian government on one or two occasions applying national security grounds. We see that in our national interest and there's no doubt that the Chinese operate the same way. So despite those statements that you played to air before, I believe the Chinese authorities behind the scenes would absolutely understand why the Australian government took the decision that it did. Right. I have heard some uh, say that uh, they lumped uh, the, uh, the, the, the participants in this uh, proposed transaction uh, together wrongly. I mean, one of the, uh, one of the parties, of course, was uh, Lee ka Cheng Cheng Kong uh, group, uh, which has done uh, business in Australia for a long, long time. And uh, I've heard that maybe that was, shouldn't have been lumped together, you know, with the broad umbrella label as Chinese investment, at least not, uh, not, not per se. Well. Well, I think you've almost answered your own question. I think the judgment here was about the nature of the asset. One of the bidders is a broad investor in Australia. They have been welcome here and they're welcome in the future. But they were seeking to invest in a different type of asset in different circumstances, which triggered the national interest guideline. They are welcome to invest in this country and it was in no way discriminated uh, on the basis uh, of that company alone. It was the asset right. that they were seeking to okay. invest in. Wayne, did you find it, uh, did you find it a, a little bit odd or uh, the timing a little bit unusual, the fact that uh, Prime Minister Turnbull, uh, at the same time, uh, you know, this uh, decision was uh, coming to warn against rising protectionism uh, within Parliament. Was that, uh, was that odd timing for comments of that, uh, of that tone? Well, I think that's part of a broader debate. You might have noticed we've had an election or two in Australia in recent times. Uh, and if you like, there's been much more polarisation in our political system. Part of that has been the election of me members of minor parties to the parliament who don't necessarily support open, free or fair trade. So I think his remarks were to be seen in that context and certainly not into the context of the operation of the Foreign Investment Review Board or China for that matter. Right. What, uh, what we saw in the last uh, election, of course, uh, Wayne was uh, you know, arguably representative of a m movement that's uh, you know, kind of swept across the world. I mean, the whole uh, Trump movement in the U.S., which uh, 
uh, gained a, a, a foothold. Uh, do you think there's any turning back? Do you think this is a short-term phenomenon, or do you think this is part of a, a longer-term fundamental shift? Oh, I think we have a very big, uh, a very big challenge, Bernie. Un unless the G20 uh, grasps the nettle uh, and says that inclusive growth is part of the sort of policy toolkit it wants to put out there, the growing uh, concentration of wealth and income and growing inequality around the, the globe is going to, to continue to feed uh, people at the political extremes and result in polarisation and, if you like, opposition to a whole range of policies which have been considered settled. So I think the G20 ought to be taking the advice of the, of the IMF and taking on board a growth agenda particularly through the deployment of fiscal policy. But when it does that, right. it ought to be talking to the world about the fact that these increasing concentrations of wealth and income are not the way ahead. Wayne, how do you think the, um, you know, that, uh, how do you think that the, uh, everybody kind of lost control of the argument that free trade, open and unfettered trade, bringing down barriers and bringing down borders benefits all? I mean, for generations, it was a, a, a nonpartisan issue. Both right and the left and right, to, you know, and, and left uh, could, could find elements to agree on that free trade brought better jobs, more income, and made people better off. How did, how did we lose control of that whole argument? Well, well we should have a, a, a sole discussion about this sometime, because while, whilst in the developing world millions of people were lifted out of poverty, the benefits weren't fairly shared in the developed world. So you look to America, for example. Uh, the middle class there has been hollowed out. There's greater armies of working poor. The distributional incomes, particularly in the developed world, have led to a backlash, which is perfectly understandable. And just because some people say globalisation is good, doesn't mean to say that they should ignore the distributional outcomes of that globalisation. And in parts of the Western world, those outcomes have been terrible for the great mass of the population in those countries. And this is the matter we should be debating globally, and it's what the G20 ought to be really focusing on. Right. Wayne, before we let you go, though, I mean, we could have, and you, you and I will talk about this again many, many times, because it's an issue you can't settle in one, two, or ten conversations. But how do you, you know, how That's are right. you, how do you, how do you be a, how does one uh, act as a, or be a cheerleader and a fan of free trade and capitalism bringing, bringing down, breaking down borders and, and barriers and yet be, be, a, be a fan of redistributionist economics? I don't understand how we can, you can put those two in the same sentence. Well, because that, that is a false dichotomy. Uh, capitalism has always uh, worked best when we've had a very good set of rules and regulations where the private sector works well with the government sector. It doesn't necessarily mean big government. It doesn't necessarily mean high tax. What it means is that you have cooperation so that the people who are supporting this system uh, are, are fairly uh, beneficiaries uh, of its distribution. Mark Carney gave a great speech about this a couple of years ago and he pointed out that unfettered market capitalism, uh, if you like, will destroy it, capitalism in the end. We need a mixed economy out there that grows for the benefit of all, not just a few. So we should definitely come back and talk about this some other time. <laughs> Wayne, that's, uh, you're on, uh, my good friend. We'll make it a day. Because I know you don't agree with me, Bernie, so... <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. That's what makes the world an interesting place. You know, I love talking to you. You're welcome anytime, Wayne. Thank you very much. Uh, Swanee, as I call him. Coming up, hundreds of...